I haven't done a field trip in a while, so I thought today would be a really good day to do one. What I want to do today is cover the history and the development of the lectionary. When did the church start using lectionaries? What were the earliest ones like? How have they developed with the passing of history? And in order to explain this, I thought I would employ a local historical feature as sort of a visual aid, the geological column. When General Palmer founded what was to become Colorado Springs around 1870, he founded it along Monument Creek at the foot of Pikes Peak. And one of the things that he bequeathed to the city was a number of open spaces and parks, a heritage of public land that we still enjoy today. Because this area has such a rich geological history, General Palmer had what he called the Geological Column erected in Monument Valley Park, which is where I'm headed today. And what he wanted to do with the column was create a monument that reflected the geological history of this region upon which Colorado Springs sits. So he had this geological column built right into the side of the Valley of Monument Creek, and it sits there to this day. Unfortunately, this column got covered over by dirt for almost 50 years, but the city recently had it restored and here we are, we're coming up on the geological calm that General Palmer built. It was covered for years and years and years and they just restored it. The very bottom strata here is Pikes Peak granite and this comes from about a billion years ago. The white sandstone at the top is only from about 90 million years ago, a mere puppy. And he had this geologically stratified to represent the different geological ages and epochs. Now the earliest record of what we call sort of a proto-lectionary, the base layer there, the Pikes Peak granite, the white layer at the bottom there, would be the Jewish readings during the time of the New Testament. Within the synagogues, it looked like they had a set pattern of reading from the Old Testament. Both Philo and Josephus, who were contemporaries of Paul, write about how Moses was to be read every week within the synagogue. In Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council, Luke tells us that Moses was read every week within the synagogues. So we see that there was a pattern for reading. We just don't know if there was a set schedule. Now we know that, for example, on the Day of Atonement or Passover, that there were select passages to be read for that, we're not quite sure about the rest of the year. But this pattern of reading from the law and the prophets within the Jewish synagogue was probably picked up by the earliest church because we need to remember that the earliest leaders of the church came from a Jewish background. Now on the Christian side, when the New Testament is written down, we definitely see connections made, especially within the Gospels and Paul's writings, between sort of fulfillment of what Jesus did and the prophetic passages of the Old Testament. And we know from the, some of the early church fathers in their sermons and stuff, that when they taught these passages, that they would refer to both the Old Testament and the New Testament passages when they preached from these. So that lays the groundwork within a church for having at least two readings during a church service. Now, by the time we hit around 400 to 600 AD, maybe the uh, red or the purple strata there, within the Jewish community, we have the Talmud being written down. And in the Talmud, we know that there are definite schedules for reading on specific days and seasons of the year. So we can see on the Jewish side that there's a development of this schedule of readings or lectionary that was to be followed within the synagogues. Around 150 years later, or around 500 AD, we have Gennadius of Masalia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and he was instructed by his bishop to come up with a list of readings to be read every Sunday. And this is the first really definitive example that we have of a lectionary schedule type of readings. We can put that as maybe the tan layer back here in between the two red ones towards the bottom and we start seeing this geological layering being built up in the formation of the lectionary. So it's probably around 500 AD, let's say up here in this strata somewhere, that we really start seeing the development of the lectionary taking place. And it primarily takes place on the Greek-speaking side of the church. 
The Latin side has lectionaries being developed, but really the evidence we have of them is not nearly as strong as what we have on the Greek speaking side. Now the thing to realize about these Greek lectionaries is that they begin to copy them by hand. Number one, we have a fair number of these that are still existing today because they were used in the everyday churches. Number two, these were the workhorse Bibles for the church. The lectionaries were copied by hand, probably by the clergy or by monks, and these were what the clergy used for preaching every week within their churches. So they were the workhorses. This is what they read and studied from to prepare their sermons. The Bibles were really kept on the bookshelves and they were the expensive treasures of the church. The third thing it tells us is that a lot of these lectionaries, when we find them, are really in pretty rough shape because they were used so much. And then the fourth thing they tell us is that because the lectionaries were copied by hand, it would be a lot easier, let's say if I came to your church to copy the lectionary to bring back to my church, I would copy it out of your lectionary. So I would take the gospel reading, the Old Testament reading, the Psalm, and just copy them straight out of your lectionary into a new lectionary. What this does is it preserves for us the link between the Old and the New Testament texts that these clergy were using during that period of time. It also lets us see that perhaps in one church up in Northern Greece, they used Isaiah, let's say chapter seven and Matthew chapter four, they link these two. But in another church in Southern Greece, they, for example, might've made the connection between a text in Ezekiel and Matthew chapter four. So it lets us see trajectories of interpretation based upon the various texts that were linked together, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Psalms, and maybe the epistles, how that was linked together within that particular lectionary in different regions. And one final point about this sort of fifth strata for the lectionaries during this time is that we can take all of the Bibles that we have during that period of time and push them off to one side and just use the lectionaries that we have and we can reconstruct probably 99% of the biblical text just off these lectionaries. We don't even have to go to original biblical sources. We can look at what the lectionaries have. So this is another way in which the biblical tradition has been preserved for us down through the centuries was through the lectionaries during this period from about 500 up to about 1000 AD. They're very, very important. Now, while we're talking about these Greek lectionaries, what I want to do is take a quick side trip over to the website for the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. Now, this organization has been digitizing a lot of New Testament manuscripts from around the world, and they have a good collection of lectionaries that date from 800 AD onwards. And I want to just show you a few. Now, this first lectionary is labeled GA Lect 17 and it dates from around 800 AD. And I'm just going to show you one page, one of the opening pages here, and it starts with a reading from John 1.1. 1, 1. Now remember, this is what the clergy would be reading from in the worship services of their church. And so you're actually seeing a text here from over 1,200 years ago that was used within the church. The second example I'm going to flip to here is Lectionary 34. This is about the same time as Lectionary 17. You can also know that this lectionary has been treated much more kindly. It's better preserved. And also the scribe was probably a little bit more skilled than the other one. His lettering and the illuminations on the page just seem to be a little bit straighter, a little bit more organized. But once again, it reflects a text that was used within worship from around 1200 years ago or 800 AD. Now from about 1000 AD up until the Reformation, it really looks like we have about three broad strokes to the different trajectories of lectionaries that we have. One in the Eastern side of the empire where they speak Greek and write Greek and the church worships in Greek, we have sort of the Greek or the Byzantine lectionaries. And I've already talked about them. They go all the way back to 500 AD or earlier with Chrysostom. Then in Central and Western Europe, where you had the Holy Roman Empire that was started by Charlemagne, you really had a new tradition of lectionaries that was brought about that's being used in what will later become the Catholic Church. But this lectionary system sort of represents a Western tradition. It's based off the Greek system, but it develops its own patterns. And then finally within England, we have another tradition 
which is what we call the Sarum Missal. Sarum is the old English name for what we would now call Salisbury, where there was a major cathedral. Now within the Sarum Missal, it was really based upon the selectionary that Charlemagne started and that the Western Church used. But I think because of the geographical isolation of the church in England, they developed some of their own particular links and holidays to use the various texts. No coffee today, today's water. But I hope you all have your coffee. Now with the Reformation, the average person's relationship to the Bible and the lectionaries is radically changed and transformed. The invention of the printing press meant no longer that the lectionaries and the Bibles were copied by hand and incredibly expensive and time-consuming produce. Now with the invention of the printing press, it meant that the average family that had some money would be able to afford a Bible. They were still expensive. It was probably along the lines of like buying a good TV. Now within the Calvinistic type traditions, the lectionary was discarded in favor of preaching from the Bible sort of chronologically. So within their churches, they would preach, let's say, through the Book of Romans or through one of the Gospels, and the lectionary schedule was more or less dropped. Within the Lutheran, the Methodist, the Catholic, and the Church of England, the lectionary schedule was still maintained. What's interesting during this time is that the printing houses really began to churn out lectionaries for the average person. It not only included readings for that Sunday, but for every day of the week, and oftentimes for morning and evening, reflecting the, the prayer practices that took place within the village churches or the monasteries. And this development we might put, put as sort of like the dark line right below the white line at the very pot top there, the, the sandstone that was laid down about 90 million years ago. Now from 1500 until fairly recently, there was a fairly wide diversity in lectionary and lectionary reading schedules. Lutheran, Methodist, Anglican, Catholic, everybody really seemed to have their own lectionary schedule. There was some agreement within them, but there was a lot of diversity within them. All of that changed in the 1960s. And this brings us to the white layer at the very top up there, the sandstone layer that was laid down just recently, only 90 million years ago. At the Second Vatican II Council from 1962 to 1965, one of the most important things that came out of that council was the order for mass readings. This was a standardization of the lectionary within the Catholic Church, and it was important because it did two things. Not only did it standardize the lectionary readings, it also meant that the priests were to focus more of their preaching and teaching out of the biblical text. In terms of the lectionary schedule, what the Ordo did in terms of setting the lectionary and the trajectory it goes in is that instead of having a one-year lectionary where you tried to read through the entire Bible in one year, the Ordo changed it so now you had a three-year cycle. And I discussed this in last week's video, but basically year one you would read from Matthew, year two you would read from Mark, year three you would read from Luke, and then John is interspersed throughout those three years. During the season from Pentecost until Advent, the largest chunk of the year, which in the Catholic tradition and a lot of other traditions is called ordinary time, meaning numbered or ordered time. What takes place during those, those periods is that readings from the Gospels tend to follow the chronological order within the Bible. And then if they're reading from the epistles, the epistles are also read chronologically during this time as well. Now, after the adoption of the order for mass readings at the, after the Second Vatican II Council, the Protestant churches, not wanting to get left behind, started work on a lectionary revision of their own. And this took place through a collaboration of many different denominations under the consultation for a common text. And like the Catholic Church, they adopted a three-year cycle, year A, B, and C. And like the Catholic Church, Matthew's read in year one, Mark in year two, Luke in year three, and then John is interspersed. In fact, the result from the consultation for a common text was what we now call the revised common lectionary. And I'll have a list of the different denominations that have adopted this. This is by far and away on the Protestant side, the most common lectionary to use. It doesn't mean that different denominations and groups don't use their own lectionary. It just means that this is the most common one. Now, what the development of the Revised Common Lectionary and the Order for Masses really illustrates for us is that 
the different churches that follow a liturgical year and use the lectionaries all are reading from basically the same text. And as a result, you could attend, let's say, a Presbyterian church listening to the readings read for that week, then go across the street to a Methodist church and hear the same text being read there as well. It presents a brilliant illustration for this whole idea of the unity of the body of Christ when everybody is sort of reading from basically the same text every Sunday, whether they're in India or in North America. Now, one of the things I hope you pick up from this is that lectionaries represent a very long collaborative effort within the Christian church. They're also a treasure that has been preserved for us and handed down within the Christian tradition. Now, there's a lot of different aims within the lectionaries as a whole. The goal of the lectionaries, we could kind of summarize under three things. They're to expose the worshipers to the breadth and the scope of the scriptures by reading through most of the Bible on a three-year cycle. The second thing is, they're really designed to help you see connections between the Old Testament, the Gospels, the Psalms, and the New Testament epistles. And the third thing is, because you have these periods where we read through the various texts in a chronological manner, they're really designed to help you get a handle on one particular book or topic as you go through the lectionary schedule. Lectionaries are structured around the liturgical year, this means that they start with Advent at the beginning of December, not with the new year in January. Because the lectionary readings follow the liturgical year, it means also it follows the seasonal changes that we have within the year as we go through life. The lectionary has been shaped over the centuries by different cultures, different continents, and different thinkers with different Christian traditions it reflects this rich diversity that we have within the church. The lectionary represents the theological thought and imagination of almost two millennium of church leaders who have really worked on which text to read at different times. To a certain extent, we can say that the lectionaries that we have today are highly artistic in their construction and their final form. I hope you've enjoyed this very quick tour through one aspect of the church's history and tradition. If you enjoy these videos, be sure to subscribe, share it, leave a comment below, and give a thumbs up. Don't forget, I've got the shorter video series now that's part of this channel, Expresso, where I try and take short snippets and explain ideas that are related to biblical interpretation. This past week, I examined the value of having Bible software that you can use and I'm making some recommendations and where you can find reasonably priced packages. This week, I'm gonna be covering the value of study Bibles and review a couple of them for you. And I've got a really great giveaway and I hope to see you all then and there. Until later, peace. Okay, it's time to head back home. Edit this video.